Hello and welcome to my devlog. My name is Jarmo, aka HeroCrab, and in this episode I will introduce my plugin for use with Flax games. The talking points for this video will be 1. What is HeroCrab plugin? 2. Overview of the components and 3. Where can I get it? At the time of this recording, the repository is still private, though I anticipate once I publish the video, I will make the rep repository public. Without further ado, let's get started. Essentially, what I'll be doing in this video is going over the README. The README includes all sorts of information, provides an overview of the components, a diagram, and then goes through getting started and everything you'll need to do to bring up networking in your Flax game. So question number one, what is HeroCraft Plugin? HeroCraft Plugin is a plugin project for Flax games that provides an authoritative network messaging framework for use in multiplayer games developed with Flax Engine. It was designed to be simple, flexible, and modular with the primary use case of distributed player-owned servers and centra centralized catalog servers. This is actually the third version of Netcode that I've written. I've spent a long time studying Netcode and while I don't consider myself an expert or a professional developer, this is a great amateur project and I hope it will be of service to you. So we'll start here by going over uh, the components. The first thing that you'll need to familiarize yourself with when using this plugin are the general components and what they do. Uh, there is a configuration component, which includes all of the ho uh, basically host-based and IP-based information um, that you can retrieve from parsing command line arguments, and there'll be an example of this further down. There's a settings file, or I'm sorry, not a settings file, but a settings class, which dictates the game tick rate and the packet rate and buffer depth. It's basically characteristics related to the networking. There is a boot class, which is a static class for storing the configuration. Then there is the default UDP sublayer server implementation and the default UDP sublayer client implementation. There is a class which is called a stream. This facilitates um, holding all of the elements, which I'll discuss in a minute, and all of the sessions. There is a stream group, which is a filter setting, allowing you to uh, basically pick and choose which elements are streamed to which clients. Then there is the workhorse of this netcode, which is the element. This is essentially an RPC-like messaging tunnel between two endpoints. There is the field, Fields are added to elements, and fields indicate RPC endpoints. Then there are sessions. This is a higher level abstraction of the sublayer. And then there is the sublayer itself. What I've included in the plugin currently is an, an ENET based UDP sublayer, although I have also written a, um, a significant amount of a TCP based sublayer which uses. Um, concurrent sessions for non-blocking. It was actually writ written uh, when I was working with Godot, though I have not um, ported it to this plugin and I, I may not do so. I'm not sure. Yet. So there is a diagram included here. I will zoom out a little bit. Um, I'll briefly describe the diagram. Essentially, uh, what I tried to do here was fit everything into the diagram at a, at a high level, uh, a conceptual level, so this can be used as a reference. And I think, it, I think it does a good job of it, um, but I'll go ahead and explain these items. So this upper box here is the server script, and this lower box here is the client script. Now this plugin does not include these scripts. Uh, I may you know, update this later to include uh, working examples, um, but this is the messaging framework pieces. Uh, really, the script architecture and the way you lay out everything and integrate it into your game is really game dependent. So the messaging framework can be used to create uh, pretty much anything you can come up with from a networking perspective, at least in my mind. Um, the server script here is, again, is the upper box. The client script here is this lower box. Within those scripts, you have server script logic, and it is responsible for uh, basically starting and stopping the server here. This white box here is the net server. I'll go ahead and zoom in here. And so your server script will start, will create, the net server will start it, will process it, etc. There are some delegates for when sessions are connected and disconnected, and the server script will handle those. And then the server script is also responsible for creating elements. Now again, elements are RPC-like tunnels, if you will. 
Uh, I'm a network engineer by trade, so that a lot of this is using uh, networking terminology. Okay, so within the NetServer script, you have the NetStream. The NetStream is where all of the elements reside and then where all the sessions reside. So here, when the server creates an element, it gets added to this elements list, and then th there's an element created delegate, which is triggered or invoked, and that comes over to a spawner script. Now this can all be in your server script, you can have separate scripts for this, you can basically go crazy with the design here. Um, th this example, or this illustration, is showing an add actor method which is invoked, and this spawner script would essentially spawn prefabs and keep track of them in a dictionary based on element ID. And I'll go over this more uh, when I get down to examples uh, in the API. So each element has a couple of methods here available to it. Um, basically, there are setters and getters for these elements. And then each element, it's recommended that you would have a one-to-one -one relationship between a network element and a game script. And furthermore, it would be network element, game script, and a prefab because the spawner system here is going to spawn a prefab based on the element ID. Okay, moving towards the client, uh, the communication, bet basically the, the NetStream itself and the Net Sessions are responsible for facilitating this CUD system, which is a create, update, delete system for the elements. So this is an authoritative messaging framework. Elements can only be created on the server. Once an element is created on the server, it is then sent to the client and created here. Updates are also uh, obviously sent to the client as well as deletions. Now, when things are get created on the client, they get added to the elements list here. If the client, if the client session ID is equal to the author ID of the element, then the element gets copied to an input elements list. The input elements list contain, uh, includes writable elements. So that's the authoritative portion, right? The client can only write to input elements. There are some delegates here which are called or invoked. There are some events, sorry, there's an uh, element created event and an element deleted event. And then again, similar to the server, the client script is responsible for creating, starting, processing, the net client. And then there are some events here for session connected and session, disconnect, session disconnected. So this is the high level overview of how things are working. I've got this working currently with a catalog server, a game server and clients. And in the next video following this one, I'll actually go over some of how that is implemented. So moving down through the readme, uh, the quickest way to initialize everything is to parse the command line from the game. I currently do this and I send a number of um, commands, command line arguments to the game when I launch it, indicating what role it needs to run in and what port numbers to use. You can also do this, this is just a string, essentially. You can also do this directly, or you can just use the public setter and create the net config yourself. Now this is using Enet. Enet does support IP version four and IP version six. IP addresses and host names. There are a number of operational argument or optional arguments which can be used to specify boot information. These are listed here. These are just examples. I'm using role server, role client, role uh, catalog. And these are some of the defaults here. Okay, so creating. So to create a, a server, or a client, the first thing you need to do is, is create the settings. And these basically control uh, the, the modulo function between the game tick rate and generating packets. So there's a game tick rate here. There are a couple settings. I think I have 30 and 60 in by default. And then there's some target packets per second settings, 30 here, 30 here, etc. Then there's a re reliable depth buffer, uh, which I set to maximum and then obviously you set your max connections. Now the reliable buffer depth, this is answering the question of for reliable based fields or reliable based elements, um, when those are sent, how, how much do I buffer of those? Um, so for example, an action command, when you press an action like attack, uh, you can't drop those packets. Your, whatever you have going on your game needs to attack. So that would be sent reliably. 
and you would indicate that when you set that field up. Um, that will then be have basically, you know, in this case, it'll have, you know, 255 depth of buffer. And the buffer is essentially um, pulled from every game tick. So I, I don't know how much of that I'll go over in this video, but um, essentially you want this number to be very high. The unreliable buffer depth is going to be very lean. It's going to be set at essentially the modulo plus one of these two values, the game tick rate and server uh, pack, uh, server packets per second, essentially. So that way unreliable you know, analog input will be very responsive. To create a server or client, use a specified factory, provide network settings and register for events. So you essentially uh, create your settings. Then you'll create the server. You might want to subscribe to some logging and then there are the events for session connected and session disconnected are off of the stream as well as element created, element deleted. That is pretty much all I do in terms of the server. And then here you can see these methods. Uh, this is just some examples, you know, do, do what you're going to do here. There's a lot of different strategies that I've toyed with in using this, um, but this seems to be pretty straightforward. Ensure you unregister from events in the onDestroy method of your server and or client scripts when destroying or before assigning the server, uh, reassigning the server and or client. Processing. Uh, every game tick that you have needs to be processing. So because this is fixed, we need a fixed update. Uh, with Flax, you're going to want to use the onFixedUpdate method, which is running at 60 hertz by default. And then to start it, server start, this would be the same for the client. You do your server address and your server port. If it's the client, this will be uh, basically your destination address and your destination port, which again are all initialized from CLI command arguments, command line arguments, or through your own scripts. Okay, so moving down to elements. I said elements was the workhorse of this uh, messaging framework, and it really is. It You know, when I was writing it, I was visualizing everything more um, packetized with TLV fields and headers and things like that. Um, but as I kind of abstracted this, you know, the element is really an RPC messaging tunnel. It's kind of like a channel, if you will. Um, once the server is started and a client connects to the server, the session connected event will be invoked. It is then typical to create a writable network element so that the client can send to the server. So the first thing that I've been doing is once the session is connected, immediately create some type of writable element. Now this is just an example here. The first thing you typically would you would typically not create a player controller first, um, but this is just an example. I'm creating a version checking class, which checks the version between the client and the server. Elements can only be created on the server and only those where the author ID match the session ID can be written to by a client. Additionally, elements are streamed to all clients unless they have a non-zero recipient property. So when you create this first element, probably the first series of elements until you get to the actual game scene, most of those elements will have the recipient ID set to the session ID. Now this element is going to be tied via some code, via some script um, extension to a game script. And, and when, when the prefab is spawned through use of this asset ID here, then the prefab will be instantiated in the scene that scene will kick up, that script will kick up, and then there will be a reference to the element here. And that's how you connect the RPC tunnel essentially to your game scripts. Uh, network elements are RPC-like RPC -like messaging tunnels which comprise added fields and typically have one-to-one -one parity with game scripts. When creating an element, you can do it immediately or in the disabled state. By creating an element in the disabled state, you can then take advantage of the element created event on the server and the asset ID field of the element description to spawn a corresponding game prefab, gaining the possibility to use the onStart method in the instantiated prefab object script to declare fields. So what this means is if you take a very simple approach, and I don't actually have this depicted here, which I should possibly update this. Uh, when you create this element, actually I do, it's right here. It used to be a property and I put it through the constructor or the, through the method. So when you create this element, this last uh, parameter here, or this last argument here is false for enabled. So this player controller element will not be enabled. In other words, it will not be streamed to anyone. 
once this asset ID is spawned, the prefab is spawned, and that script kicks up, then through the reference, you know, the cache reference to this element, I can then enable it after I define the fields, which I'll show below. This example uses an actor database, which maps actor, actor database enum uint values to prefabs through a dictionary populated in Flax editor. The stream, the stream group is a bitmask set on both the session and element. It can be used to filter elements to a session for different scenes or visibility groups, lobby versus loading. Right, so this player controller will be spawned. Well, it, it will be spawned in the scene, but it won't have any fields attached to it, so there won't be any RPC endpoints. The prefab will be instantiated, will be added to the scene, the script will go through the on start process, then we can define some um, elements. During that, or some fields, sorry, when we define those fields, we can also set the stream group. So this is basically saying, you know, what, what group am I streaming to? And this is a very capable way of differentiating between levels, scenes, you know, worlds, different UI, right? You know, if you're in the lobby versus the loading screen, etc. Using the above approach, the element created event will be invoked on the server. Generally, from this point, the server would instantiate a prefab and add the object to the scene. A reference to the element and stream is useful to cache in a prefab script for later use. For this caching, one approach is to extend script and create a uh, net script. I'll have to fix this typo here. And then set element and server properties. Let me make a note real quick. Okay. That way I don't have to do this more than several times. Okay. So on the so once the once this element is created, this on element created will be invoked even at least on the server, even while the element is disabled. And this is by design. Um, so when this on element is invoked, this would be in my network spawning class. I will basically um, look at the asset ID off of the element description and then spawn it from a database, from a dictionary. And then if this is on the server, then I'll set the server, I'll basically cache a reference to the to the stream itself and then I will update I'll grab this script which net script is is an extension of just the regular game script and I will cache the server and I will cache the element I will add it to a tracked list this is so that it can very easily remove everything from the scene at once that was spawned by the network implementation uh, for example, when you change change scenes or when you um, disconnect from the game, etc. And then the significant note here that I found is that if you if when you instantiate the prefab, if you set the parent to null, essentially nothing happens. It's it's not going to be added to the scene or anything. And then once these items are cached, then you can set the parent here, and it will be added to the scene. To delete an element, call delete. This will invoke element deleted on the server and eventually the client once it's uh, w once it's withdrawn from the stream. This example also tracks the spawned actor in an actor's dictionary, which is used to remove all network spawn actors later. So on element deleted, right? It just checks this dictionary and sets the parent to null and destroys it. After gaining an understanding of elements, there is one helpful property called a sibling. I don't really have a section on this. This will, this will become apparent if you need this when you're working with this. The property can be used to cache a reference on the server. There's another typo. To a separate element from this stream or another stream. This can be leveraged in various design patterns for coupling different streams together, registration for an advertisement. Or if you're trying to do multiple elements per script. Uh, there's essentially a way just to cache uh, cache references to other elements on the server only. Let me annotate this typo here as well. Okay. And continuing. Fields. By creating elements in disabled state and caching a reference to them in the script or network script, it is then possible to add fields in the onStart method before the element is streamed to clients. 
This cleans up element field creation and ensures that all RPC-like functionality is defined within a game script. So I, when I was first working with this, I didn't have a way to defer the creation of the elements or the streaming of the elements until I put the enabled state in. And that's when it hit me. Doing it that way meant I could define all of the fields for an element inside the single script. So when you get to using this, um, you'll be defining basically both sides of the RPC conversation in the single game script. And if you do it through overriding the script class, it's actually cleaner um, because you can then provide override methods for the client and server. You can differentiate them um, and you can make them virtual so that you don't, you don't need them all in your script. Uh, the, de the method that I demonstrate down here is actually just checking this, this Boolean here. But um, I will, I'll get to that here. The below example differentiates the environment the script is running on by checking the is server property on the element before implementing logic. It demonstrates one-way transmission of a writable element from the client to the server. It is also possible to create custom logic in your network script and have specific methods for on-client start or on-server start established in on-start. So this is what I'm doing. Essentially, I can just override these methods with my net scripts, um, and that kind of cleans up cleans up the code a little bit versus you know checking it all on doing it in a single on start or on update method on fixed update when adding a field to an element you can specify whether the field is to be delivered reliably or unreliably this equates to the delivery method as well as providing relevant field buffer depth for analog and responsive predicted player movement use an unreliable field for scene control ui control or other critical actions which must be invoked and rendered use reliable fields once an element has been enabled you cannot add fields to it unless you first disable it or at least for at least one game tick. Uh, once the element is re-enabled, fields will be propagated to clients. So in other words, if you do find that you need to add another field to the element later, you must disable the element on the server. One game tick must elapse before you re-add them. Now, I don't have a use case for that. It's just something that I tested. I'm defining everything in on start and there's no need for that at all in with what I'm doing. So here you can see, um, there are cached some fields using this generic interface template. Um, here we have a player name, a direction, and attack. Attack is using a byte value. Uh, I did add, you know, vector two, three, four, and quaternions to this that are referencing the flax classes. Um, so in this example, right, when the script is initialized in the scene, it checks if this is running on the server, then I want to create all of these fields. So I'm creating a string with a name. It is reliable. And it, the, the callback is on named received. There's also direction. It is not reliable. This is analog. Callback is on direction received. Attack is reliable. Callback is on attack received, etc. Then I, I then set the stream group to default and enable it. Once this is enabled, eventually, because this is all single threaded, right? Eventually, uh, this will be sent from the client to the servers and then it will be created on all of the clients as well. So if this is not running on the server, so the flip side of this conversation is I just want to cache references to these endpoints, to these RPC endpoints or these fields. So get the string, you get them by name essentially, as well as method. If you, if you do something wrong here, you just, you just get null back. Get bytes. Um, this actually needs updated because I changed this to a vector three. It looks like I missed it in the, in the readme. So let me make another note on that. Okay, great. All right, so then you have your callbacks here. Do something, do something, do something. Okay, moving along. So right now we're covering, you know, element uh, field creation through the element. Below is an example of bidirectional communication within the same script. This script is used as a version checker. This I actually yanked out of uh, my script. We'll see if there's any updates that I need to put in here. So on start, um, no, this isn't actually from mine because I'm doing these other methods here, which is, you know, on client start, on server start, but you get the idea. So there's a string added here for version. It is delivered reliably. There's a callback for it. Um, you actually don't have to specify a callback on the server if you don't want. 
status, I'm caching a reference to the field, which is a string. For status, it is reliably delivered. And then the element is enabled. And then if this is the client, cache a reference to the setter and update basically the callback for status. So what this is doing here is um, on the client, the client is calling set version, probably, you know, in the on start function, right? Uh, version 1.0, this is just an example, is sent to the server. On version received is called on the server, is invoked on the server. If it matches, then set version is matching. Simple example. And then on status received, you know, update the USI UI with the status message. Fields can be added to elements with a provided callback, retrieved from elements by name to be used as a setter or updated with a callback, i.e. set action. This satisfies all use cases in various client server architectures. So here's just three, basically the three things you can do with fields. So you'll, everything you should need to do, it should be included in these three options. Okay, so filtering. To filter elements from sessions, there are two options. The first option is to set the recipient of an element to the session ID of the intended target session. If the recipient is zero, typo here, it will be sent to all clients. The second option is to use the element filter stream group property, which is a bit mask of type net stream group. Setting this property on an element provides an efficient and capable means of filtering at the macro level. Below are the default options for setting the stream group and what it looks like to set this on the session. So if you don't know what a bit mask is or enum flags is sometimes referred to, you probably need to look that up. Essentially, um, it's just a binary, it's a binary uh, bit mask. And so you can actually set these multiple options here. You could set, you know, lobby and team one if you wanted to for chat messages. Um, you, you can mix and match them any way you want to, uh, or you can just set them holistically to a single value. So I use them currently, I haven't gotten to a whole bunch of uh, game code yet, but for version checking and bringing up and loading and establishing the game environment and loading the world and all that, I have that working. And I'm essentially using, you know, lobby, load, select, game, etc to pedal the session through uh, spawning of all the Im uh, Im intended elements or prefabs. On the server, on session connected, session stream group, net stream group lobby. So this would be, you know, if they, if they first connected into the lobby on your game, then you would set the stream group to lobby here. Then you would create an, el an element in the disabled state and once you created that element, you would also set that element stream group to lobby. Okay, moving right along. We are getting towards the bottom here. Uh, on the game object network script, here is another example of essentially um, messaging and using stream groups. So this is saying on start, if element is server, element filter stream group, set it to lobby, add a string, message, enable it. If it's the client, cache the setter. And then when the client wants to send a message, they just use set on the setter and it will, it, the, in, the callback will be invoked on the server. Now something that's not depicted here. Uh, yeah, it's right here actually. So these kind of work together, right? the session on the server is set to the lobby stream group. And then so is the element when it's created. Sessions. There are a couple of important notes regarding sessions. These are when a client session disconnects, all elements authored by it are deleted. So uh, they will be removed from the game. So this is going to be anything related to that session. It could be the player character, it could be the player's, you know, um, score or something, whatever you're defining as elements. 
When a client session transitions to a new stream group, all previous elements will have element deleted invoked for them on the client, yet they will continue to exist on the server. They'll just be tagged with that other stream group. This allows for quickly changing scenes, levels, and worlds. So say you had a game world where you had you know, a field, and then off of that field you had maybe um, like a little cave or something, or a, you know, a house, an NPC's house. Those could be tagged with different stream groups. I don't know if I would recommend that level, that type of implement, uh, implementation um, using stream groups, but this is just an example. The example is when you're in the field, you're going to receive all the elements that are also tagged with the stream group for field. When you go into the house, you would receive all of the elements for the field group tagged house. Now, I wouldn't recommend that particular use case because you wouldn't want to be defining all of these like this. Um, for that, you could come up with another layer of abstraction here. Um, through something like a stream controller or something and track it up in your game game logic and just use the messaging framework to um, send you know what what is currently in the scene there's, there's a lot of different abstraction and layers you can do with this but it's it's com important to communicate that point is that the element deleted will be invoked on the client yet they will still be on the server when a client connects it will receive existing elements for its assigned st stream group post filtering so those elements will have fields set with the last known field value. This means all players will be populated with their current positions. So this solves the problems of a lot of RPC implementations whereby, um, you know, if, if you're joining a zone or you're, you know, some characters are loading, um, you wouldn't get updates from them based on their last known position at the time of your connecting until they actually sent their update. It's just the problem uh, with RPCs. If you don't cache state and resend the last known state upon joining, um, then you wouldn't you wouldn't have the most current information. So this does do that. Only deltas are streamed over a session. Essentially, if there are no fields changed, there is nothing streamed. Elements with both reliable and unreliable fields will always be streamed over a session reliably, only if there are reliable fields with change is queued. So if you have an element that can that includes both unreliable and reliable data or fields, it will be marked reliable only if there are fields with you know reliable fields with ch uh, changes queued. Else it will just be unreliable. Security. Uh, HeroCraft plugin was designed to provide a reasonable level of security given its primary use case of developer or player hosted servers and a catalog server. Think Minecraft, think distributed game servers. Um, one of the games I play that uses this is called Grim Dawn. It doesn't, use, it doesn't actually use this framework, but it uses this type of architecture. So authoritative server. Uh, elements must be created on the server and the server grants write permission to them for a single session. Attempting to write to an element in which a session is not the author is not permitted. Attempting to write to a bogus elements are also not permitted. Rate limiting packet rates are limited based on network settings. That was that network settings class that we talked about at the beginning of this video. Exceeding the packet rate plus five, this can be tweaked, will result in forced disconnect. Uh, cryptography, so this is something I recently put in and I really only put it in to solve one problem, but by by default, sublayer communications between client and server are encrypted using XXTIA. This is a very lightweight, simple algorithm. And pre-shared keys. Uh, this is a minimal compute-based cryptographic algorithm that provides light privacy. Initially, traffic is encrypted using a key en encrypting keck, which can be viewed and set up in sublayer.cs. Once the session connects and the session ID is assigned, an additional tech is established for the duration of the session. This key is sent directly from the server to client. Using the keck, this is a minimal approach to security and can trivially be, trivially be compromised by decompiling the game binary executable, extracting the keck, and then capturing the initial session establishment to decrypt the tech. In this case, an eavesdropper would be able to inject input from the client to server. Now, for, for me and the games that I'm writing with a distributed you know, hosting env environment, this is completely fine in my, in my mind. Um, Again, if you if you want more security, there is an iCrypto module interface. You could write, you know, um, AES 128, 256, whatever. You could write something to facilitate your own key exchange using a token server, REST API, something else. But for what I'm doing, this is I consider this to be more than adequate. Essentially, there's light privacy 
on the sessions. In other words, you can't just read it. And if you really did want to inject input or do some packet spoofing, you'd have to capture a player session, which in this distributed server architecture, it, that's going to be rather difficult unless you compromise something near the host. In which case, why are you hacking my game? <laughs> you should be doing something else. Okay, for games um, which require username, password, login, this is more of a disclaimer. Persistent data storage, digital assets, and or in-game purchases do not use the default method of encryption. Do not use this method of encryption. For these cases, you will need to implement another authentication encryption scheme, which offers more security, a starting point. Uh, a starting point would be to write a class to facilitate secure key or token exchange and inherit from my crypto module. Add encrypt, uh, hero craft plugin. So to add this to your game, I basically echo what's in the documentation here, uh, the Flax docs. The plugin is considered a plugin project. Documentation for plugin projects can be found here. To add hero craft plugin to your game, complete the following, clone the repository or download it to plugins directory, update Flax project. This is a typo. Let me add this to my typo list. Update Flax project file as follows. You add a reference to the project here again, which is in this plugins directory. Add a reference to build CS for your game and include the public dependencies. Right click Flax project, generate project script files, launch Flax editor to ensure the plugin shows up under tools plugins. Here's an example. If you have any difficulties with this process, visit the discord. Uh, contributions. So I did say earlier, you know, I've been writing code since about 2017, um, self-taught, studied a lot of network code. I'm a huge fan of .NET. You know, don't, don't kick me for saying that. Um, I've done some C++, but I, I fully know and understand that there is room for improvement in this code base. I'm certainly not wanting to come across as, you know, someone that is claiming to be professional and, you know, here's a AAA product, whatever, et cetera. So for things like optimization, you know, reducing iter iteration, you know, using, you know, structs in lieu of classes or whatever, if you have recommendations and you're using this or you want to take a look, please send them to me. I'd like to improve this. I'd like to use this in my own games. I'd like this to be something easy for other people to use. Uh, I guess this is uh, also a, another point dimension. I understand Flax is implementing their own networking. They currently are putting in lower level API uh, using Enet, which this plugin is also using. Um, and I have no idea what their framework will look like. I'm sure it will be fantastic and it will work and it will be unit tested, etc. cetera. Um, but this is just how I've solved the problem of networking. And I really spent a long time trying to break the architecture down as simple as possible um, using these components of, you know, elements and fields and streams. And then, you know, limiting the API as, as, as much as I could with just a couple events and a couple switches, toggles, and that's, that's it. So back down to contributions. Um, if you do contribute anything and I put it in, I'll mention you in the contributors. And then the conclusion, again, I kind of just stated this, but the simple components of streams, elements, fields, and stream groups can be combined to create capable, complex architectures. The game type and multiplayer design will infer the logic built around these components. It is possible to build multi-layer client server architectures. If you are in need of additional examples other than what is provided here, check the unit or integration tests. If that does not suffice, feel free to contact me on the Flex Engine Discord. Hope this will be of service to you. Now with that, I have applied for GitHub sponsorship. <laughs> I wouldn't expect much um, in terms of this effort but I thought it would be a good thing to get established for myself as I work on other things, including the game that I'm going to announce here in a couple of videos. And so um, I have not been accepted to the GitHub sponsorship yet, but if I am and you are using this and you feel like giving me a donation or a gift for this work, uh, it would be greatly appreciated. I would use it to pay my internet bill. <laughs> and um, so yeah, that's that's it. I'm going to go back to the title screen here. So in this episode, episode three, we've talked about, you know, what is the plugin? We went through an overview of the components, which were elements, fields, sessions, stream groups, streams. Um, and then where can you get it? It will be public here shortly. I'm going to fix these typos and then flip the switch on that. 
and so there is the URL to access it. Again, if you do decide to use this or check it out, you know, even if you barely get into the door, but you at least clone the repository or fork it or whatever, that will be great. Feel free to send me a message on the Discord and say, hey, I'm using this and I will, if I'm available, I will see if I can help you and maybe we can improve this and make it better. That's all I have. Thank you for watching.